everyone. This is a bit of business. My name is John Fitzgerald. I'm on behalf of Learmedia.tv and the British and Irish Trading Alliance. Welcome to the show. If you've ever started a business or if you have ever exited a business and if you are considering either right now, then I think this is the show for you. Many folks in our audience have taken the leap and started a new business. Many in our audience are at an age where they may well be considering leaving their business. In either situation, there are many things to consider. Fortunately, our guests today are ideally placed to comment on this. Julie Anderson, Chris Harding, and Martin Mokler, thanks for joining us today. So let me start with a few introductions. Julie, who is a BITA Kent board member, established Rap Interiors with her husband back in 1988. And it has since been uh, very successful and transformed into a design and fit out contractor that delivers excellent results, covering all aspects of commercial refurbishment across the UK. So in April, Julie will step away from her business after many years at the helm. As a result, Julie is very well placed to give us valuable insights and reflections on her business journey and what it takes to depart successfully. Martin is one of the lead advisory partners at Evans Mokler in London. They're a progressive firm of accountants, auditors, business and tax advisors who specialize in the construction industry together with property developers and investors and owner managed businesses throughout the UK and Ireland. Martin is also a board member of BITA in London. Chris is a business transformation specialist who understands the challenges at different stages of the personal and business growth journey. He has worked on everything from local startups to complex global organizations. He knows exactly where to start, what questions to ask and when to challenge. Importantly, he knows how to architect an enterprise and in which order to build it. Having now worked with over 100 SMEs, his approach is tried and tested and it works. So, folks, I'll go to you first, Martin, to start off our discussion. Is there an ideal time to start a business or exit a business or does it depend? Well, I think when it comes to exit, you're better off sell a business 10 years too early, 10 years early than a day too late. I've seen, I've seen people who've hung on just to try and get the extra bit of consideration, whatever it might be, and the, the ground has moved from under them. So um, when it comes to exit, um, timing is important, needs to be planned, um, thought about, etc. Starting a business, I think you need the appetite. Um, we, we'll all talk about, you know, budgets and capital and, and, and all the rest that's, that's really essential. But you really need appetite. And when you've got that appetite, there's no time like the present. I don't think you can ever start a business too early um, because everyone's going to make mistakes. Everyone needs to, to learn how to run a business if they haven't previously. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my thoughts on it. Chris, what are your thoughts? Um, I don't think there's ever a right or wrong time to do anything, right? Like we'd, we'd like to plan our life perfectly as to, you know, when we get married, when we have kids, when we do this, when we do that. And life is just not like that. Um, what I would say about starting a business, though, is make sure you can afford to start a business because it will take longer than you think to get going. You'll achieve a lot less in one year than you thought you could, but you'll achieve a lot more in 10 years than you thought you could. Um, and if you don't have the resources, and, and I don't just mean financial, but um, support as well to actually help you get this thing underway, uh, it can be very, very difficult. And, and the stats speak for itself, right? 80% never make it. So Julie, you've done an amazing job. Well done. Well, Julie, let's come to you on this and, and cast your mind back to when you first started Rap Interiors. It, was it the ideal time for you? And what were the challenges back then when, when you started? Uh, we didn't we didn't set out to suddenly set up a fit out contracting company. Um, my husband was working for a company, let's say, like us, and he was working for them uh, for a client in London. And unfortunately, that contractor went bust and the client said, oh, 
God, please don't leave me, Rick. We've got to finish like my office is upside down. Help. Um, but back then, many clients were sort of uh, employing the ceiling contractor, the flooring contractor, the decorator and all this. But um, my husband said to the client, well, I can take over the whole rest of the stuff that's left to do. And that sort of is where Rap was born because he was just a ceiling contractor then. And uh, But he could see that it was becoming very disjointed for clients when they had to suddenly, oh, well, I've got to get the decorator in tomorrow. Oh, no, delay him, stop it. So my husband decided to pull it all together and finish that job by bringing the trades together. And after that job, that client said, well, you saved my life. And it was a client in London, at Quilters, and they referred him to uh, another client and said, this guy's brilliant. And that's how Rap was born. So it was just Rick, really, in the beginning, trying to suddenly become an all-encompassing person when really he was just a, a carpenter and a, a ceiling contractor. So then he was like, I don't really know how I'm going to do invoicing. How am I going to do marketing? And I've got all this stuff to do. And uh, I was working in a bank. So I was like, well, you're on your own there, mate, because I work in a bank. Um, but then I had my daughter and I got involved in the company, sort of hearing about it at home. And I then actually understood what he did for a living. <laughs> and um, I got involved and I suppose the rest is history. I had to find an accountant who could show me how to work stage. Um, and through that, I self-taught myself a lot of other stuff on stage. But we did some training with an accountant. And then, of course, I got into marketing the company so suddenly I was the person doing a million things and he was at the site doing the projects so Chris um, uh, so that's Mar how rap was born not okay Sorry. thanks thanks Julie your, your sound broke up just a, a touch there but we're, we're back I think but let me come back to, to Chris and to Martin guys when you look at the, the the SMEs and the businesses that you have worked with over the years What's the difference between the businesses that succeed and the businesses that do not succeed? Chris? Yeah, so look, um, I always think of it as a bit like putting a puzzle together, right? There, there are some fundamental building blocks that have to be in place. And Julie's description there of um, Rick's uh, attention to detail and, and ability to deliver, you know, the, the product was already sound, right? That's fundamental. You know, if you can't create value for other people uh, and do it well, you're going to struggle. Um, so, so, so that was a good starting place. Um, in, in, in terms of the hundred businesses I've worked with, I would say that the ones that make the fastest progress are the ones who have the best team right? Be because they have the capacity to make more happen. You know, if you're starting a business and you're the, um, the bookkeeper, the marketing guy, the, the delivery guy, the strategy guy, I mean, that is, it's like run, you know, running on a hamster wheel. Um, so if you are starting a business where you don't actually have a, a competent team around you, um, find someone, you know, go and get yourself a coach or a mentor or hang out more with your accountant, you know, find someone who can actually help you think through all the things that need to be put in place. Otherwise you end up just being reactive and being reactive is not as effective as being creative. Yeah. Same question, Martin, those businesses that you've worked with, what's the difference between the ones that succeed and the ones that don't? Yeah, I think touching on what, Chris said, um, it's important to, to get to scale. And it doesn't, I don't mean world, world domination. I mean, to get a bit of critical mass pr pretty quickly because a one-man band, you know, can't do everything by, by, by definition. I think what's interesting, and this might be a bit left field, but something I would often say to clients, consider buying a business that might be small, and it, but in the, in the space you want to operate in because you already have customers, you already have a supply chain, you already have a team. Clearly, it, you know, it, it need reshaping to your vision, but you do hit the ground running. It can be quite daunting to start a business with, you know, zero or, or pretty limited clients on day one. So, you know, if you look at your budget and your, your costings, and you've got an amount of capital that you think you're going to incur by starting a business from, from the ground up, 
well, consider buying a small business and growing that business. So you're not starting from a stand from a standing position. So yeah, that's what I would often say. Just give clients a, a, a you know, think outside the box a little bit. Very good. And uh, Julie, uh, I'll come to the the latter part of your journey in in a couple of minutes. But I, I'd just like you to look in your rearview mirror and cast your mind back to the first couple of years of your business. If you were starting again, what would you do differently? Uh, um, I think we would focus on the marketing um, earlier. Um, so we needed to get our name out there. I mean, in the initial stages, we were relying on that client to rely to refer us to that client. And back then it was all about the yellow pages. So you advertised in yellow pages and you hoped somebody looked up and found you. Um, but uh, marketing now is, is very current and it's very uh, life, isn't it? We do everything on social. So um, I think so. marketing is the biggest thing and networking. Um, I networked from a very young um, stage of the company. Um, and I just think that you've got to get your name out there. You've got to get your face out there so that people start to know your brand and know you and trust you. Because we've tried like having business development managers here. Um, but there's nothing like the director getting off the backside and getting out there um, because people learn to trust you quicker. Um, at the time, like many years ago, we we just didn't have the capacity for me and Rick to be doing all these things. Like like Chris said, we were the juggling act in, for about the first two years. And then we took on project managers. We took on um, as an accounts lady. Then I became more aware of our brand and I needed to redesign that and I have got a bit of a creative left side of my brain so we became quite a creative fit out contractor so we design now in-house but back then I think I think as soon as you hit the ground deciding on a business you want to run you've got to get out there and listen to other people like Martin said listen to people who've set up their own websites or gone to a website company because now you need a website you need to be out there you've got to have everything at once you haven't really got time to build your brand as such. You've got to just be everywhere. And so networking does that, has done that for us. I think we're sort of quite well known. We're not as well known as we want to be, we want to be known everywhere. But um, that's for the next generation to take forward and get out there and drink all the Very good. So Martin uh, and Chris, where does investment fit into to, to this picture at the start or at the end of a journey as someone is considering in, in uh, exiting a business. So, so when you look at the, the startups that you've worked with, are in general, are people slow to take investment, reluctant to take investment? Do they take it too early, too late? What's been your experience? Chris? Um, I think investment is a, a minefield, really, uh, in that... Obviously, you need cash to be able to grow the business, right? To to invest in marketing, to invest in building your capability with your team, to you know, to 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 implement technologies and those kinds of things. Um, you know, there's a lot of noise around. There, you know, people who think they're going to be the next unicorn, and uh, they're they're obsessed by you know seed funding, round A funding, all the rest of it. Um, but you have to be, I think you have to be careful about all of those things. It depends on what your ambition is at the end of the day. You know, if you're building a small business um, and you can borrow money from friends and family or you've got savings and you can then stay owning the whole thing, that's probably a better thing. If you're going for world domination, um, well, you've got to start by being realistic about whether your product has a global marketplace you know so there's no there's no simple answer to that question i don't think um other than i think as a mindset i think it's if you if 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 there was one thing i wish i had understood a lot earlier is that to not just think about your business as a way of getting money from sales but to have the mindset that i am building an asset that generates money. And therefore, so that when you get to Julie's stage, 
you've put all the pieces of the puzzle together so that it is worth something because it can work without you. Um, and, and it's, and everything is an investment. It's an investment of time and money um, on putting the right pieces together in the right order. So if you, it, uh, where the money comes from, um, there's a whole, there's a myriad ways to get the money, whether it's debt or giving up some of your equity to an investor um, you just have to be careful with that. Martin, your, your thoughts on investment, uh, especially in the context of the construction sector, because you work with a lot of businesses in uh, the construction industry and some of them one man bands, some of them slightly, you know, very, very small businesses. And, and the reality is, if you take those individuals out of the business, there is really no business. So how, would you agree with what Chris said there? Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think from any business that's starting with a sort of greenfield site, as, as it were, from scratch, then I, generally the first port of call for funding is the three Fs, fools, friends and family. Um, and, and, you know, that's your, that's your initial sort of work, working capital. But I must say things have changed significantly over the last decade in relation to funding opportunities, like ca cash flow funding, working capital opportunities, invoice discounting. There's a lot more opportunity now than, than there used to be. So I think I wouldn't rush to seek third-party investment because you do saddle yourself with somebody who may not be participating in the business, may have a different agenda, et cetera. Um, I, I think, you, you know, it, as, as Chris said, you do need a bit of vision. Um, people start business, you know, to, to, to make money for sure, but, but you do need to be investing as you go because it is important to ensure this business has a life of its own beyond you. So that, you know, if you do step back, whether it's a sale or God forbid you're ill for a period of time, whatever it might be, that the business has some critical mass and, and can operate. And you have a good team because it's all about it's all about the team, really. Um, if you, we're assuming here you've got a decent product and service that you're offering. Um, yeah. And then you, you, you need to put a good team in place. And really, they're the, they're the key ingredients. Funding it, ironically, is probably less challenging than, than it used to be. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's, that's my thoughts on it. So, Julie, you're now down the road and you see light at the end of the tunnel and you're ready to, to move on to, to, to new, new ventures. When did you start thinking about this and what was your thought process? Uh, we started thinking about this, um, I would say, five years ago. In hindsight, I wish I'd started nine years ago because we've been five years with the boys in the business, learning the ropes, blah, blah, blah. And for the first two years, I think it was really daunting for them because they used to work for us on site as subcontractors and it's a massive different mentality to coming in and suddenly you're overseeing a different mentality within an office because on site you're managing people's trades, timescales, blah, blah, blah. In an office, you're managing people's lives really because you get to know your staff they're your family and anything you do might affect them and they become your priority um well they have become our priority we we see ourselves as a, as a one big family here we're not a massive company but we've got 16 people and anything we make a decision to do we have to think about that affects 16 families um so we've got strong family values here but um I think if we'd started like nine years ago, I might have been leaving when I was like 54 and that would have been nicer. But my financial advisor used to say to us every year when we had our, like our, our pension review or our little ISA review, what's your exit strategy? And I used to think, oh, I never want to leave. I never want to leave. And because then you do get to a point where you, you think actually it needs some new drive now, you know, and, you know, God forbid, so many people leave it late to start their easier life or I don't know if mine's going to be easier because I'm going into property refurbishment in the residential world. So, but anyway, um, if I had not left it, I might have like had more energy to do what I want to do, but um, I have no pressure when, with what I'm going to do. You know, I can do it at my own time and it, I have only got to worry about myself and Rick really and my kids, you know, so um, I wish I'd started earlier. I should have listened to my financial advisor, but I always decided that he was talking to me as though I was 75 and I was only 21 in my mind and 50 in my brain. And I was like, well, that's too early. But yeah, I wish I'd done it or thought about it earlier. 
Um, but you know, we are where we are, and um, I'm still fit and well, and rap will always be in my blood. Um, so I'll still champion it, and we've still got plans for us to work as consultants as and when, depends how busy we are, come back and support the team, cover people's holidays. So they won't quite get rid of me, maybe how they want to, but anyway. <laughs> So, so Chris, what Julie is saying there, I, I'm guessing you've heard this before where business owners have reflected and thought about perhaps I should have been looking at this a little bit earlier. What, what's been your experience with folks who have successfully exited a business and what have they put in place to make sure that that exit was successful? Yeah, so I think there's a there are slightly different challenges depending on whether you're talking about a management buyout, which is really what Julie is talking about, or whether you're talking about a straight sale to someone completely different. Um, because I think in many ways, the management buyout is easier because all of the factors that determine the value of your business are things like the quality of the team, right? Well, if it's the team that are currently running it or buying it, that that's taken care of. Um, other factors include, um, has it got robust systems and processes that are consistent so that somebody else can actually come in and, and, and operate it? Um, does it have an extendable market opportunity? Is there scope for this to go somewhere? You know, there's, there's a number of different factors that will be a determinant in the price you could get for it. And so um, in terms of timing, it's never too early to start building those things in, right? Are you building the right team or are you just hiring people to do stuff? You know, Are you hiring leaders who can actually take it somewhere? Um, are you putting systems and processes in place or are you still just making it up as you go along, hoping that everybody somehow runs around and gets everything done? Um, you're, you're building an enterprise. It's a thing. I mean, we call it a legal entity, right? Because it's a thing in itself. You're taking an idea and you're making it real, right? So imagine the end game. What, what does this company need to look like and be like for someone else to see it as valuable and want to buy it? Well, it needs to have a great team. It needs to have a great product. And it needs to have opportunity to go somewhere else. Otherwise, why would they be investing in it? Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a number of different pieces of the puzzle to um, think about and, and to kind of use a, you know, a building metaphor, you know, measure twice, cut once, think about it carefully, put the pieces of the puzzle together in your mind and then execute uh, and, and you'll, you'll be able to build a business that is good enough to sell and good enough to keep. It's much better to have options. Chris and I met almost 10 years ago, and at the time, I was very impressed with how he approached the puzzle of building a business and getting those building blocks in place. And he talked an awful lot of common sense, but you know what they say about common sense. It's not that common, uh, but thanks for those comments, Chris. Uh, Martin, would you add anything to, to what Chris said there? Because it seems to make great sense, but I'm just wondering what your experience has been. You know, I think, you know, what Chris outlined is what business owners should be doing anyway, even if they're not planning a sale, because it's going to, over time, increase the efficiency of the business, increase the value you give to customers, and by default, hopefully increase your profits. Um, and if you are considering a sale, then you want to get the, the, receive the best consideration possible. You want your metrics to be as high as they can be. So if you have systems in place, that allow the business to operate efficiently. And you know, whether that's on the supply chain side or, or processed within the business, then what, by, by default, again, the business can operate without you at the tiller all the time. And that's the key, that's the key test for any business. What happens if you spend <clears throat> a, a month in Thailand? Um, you know, is there a business to come back to? Or, or you know, clearly, depending on the size and scale of the business. But, you know, really the, the test are, it can operate without you, has it a life of its own. You do have to consider who your potential purchaser is, whether it's a trade sale or it's private equity. But, you know, that, that can change how you sort of focus the business. If it's a private equity, then clearly the, the, the team stay where they are. 
the trade sale, oftentimes businesses can be partially dismantled um, and, and some larger companies are just dropping turnover on, onto their existing um, business models. Um, but, but I think, you know, for what I would say is, as I started with here, really the improving your business should be done anyway, irrespective of, of whether, you know, you have an imminent sale. And that, that's, going to, that's going to, no pun intended, pay dividends um, and, and in the long run, make it a, a better asset and, and make it an easier sale. So I'm conscious of the time, folks. So I'm going to one last question for each of you. And it's the same question. I'll start with Julie. So for the folks that are listening in and the folks that are interested in either starting a business or exiting a business, uh, based on your experience, Julie, what's the, the one best piece of advice you could give somebody who's thinking about starting a business and the one best piece of advice you could think to give somebody who is considering exiting a business? Start with you, Julie, then Martin, and then over to Chris. Oh, I've got so many bits of advice. Maybe I should write a blog. Um, I think you've got to go into it passionate, passionate, really. You know, it's not about earning money. There have been times when Rick and I haven't been able to take our dividends, you know, over the last 30 years because we're going through tough times. So you have to put your team first because they're the team who are rowing the boat. And uh, when you get the right people in place, that's when you know that you can go on holiday. Um, for a week and it still stays there and you're not obsessed so much about your emails so you've got to be passionate and get the right people in we've always chosen people that fit the company not necessarily whether they're as great as what we think they're going to be you can teach that if they've got the first bit of skill um, but it's about the people that fit because they're the people that are going to represent your company and you want to leave every customer with a good taste in their mouth so that they pass you on to someone else. Um, so anyone that meets my team would say, wow, what lovely people. And we get that all the time. Um, so that's the starting up, work towards getting the right people. Um, as for like leaving your company, make sure you have got those processes. I remember when somebody said to us, you need to, you need to have ISO. And I thought, no, we don't need that. We're fine. But we were like sometimes throwing it in the air and going, well, what did we do wrong there? But once we did do the ISO processes, we all do follow that, not to the nth degree. It doesn't become like an anal thing, but it's a great process to have because then when someone new comes in, you can say, well, this is how we do it so that the, the baton that you're passing to the next department um, gets it in the right format because there's quite a lot of processes here. It's not just that we estimate, design, fit out, deliver, do our marketing, do our accounting. Everybody's got to have that piece of the baton that makes sense. So... Get the processes in place and then we were approached twice to uh, sell the company on the market but for us i've heard horror stories and i'm probably wrong about them all but i heard horror stories that people buy your company and then everybody's supposedly safe in their job and then nice people lose their jobs and because maybe people don't want to buy your company all they want to do is take big money and it's not about the money. It's about having a good reputation and loving your business. And um, we've declined those two offers and it was only over a Zambuka shot on a new year's Eve that the brothers said, what are you two going to do when you hang up your clogs? And we were like, how rude. Um, but anyway, that's where the conversation started and we knew that they would come in and enjoy the people that they work with and enjoy what we do for clients because we are obsessed about every job that we do and we love we love the finished product so you have to love everything i think well if you look on the rap interiors website folks you'll see some wonderful examples of the work that julie and her team have done but thank you for those reflections julie very insightful indeed martin your best bit of advice for starting a business your best bit of advice for exiting a business Mine is pretty simple, John, and you're probably going to say, you would say that anyway, but I would recommend strongly people speak to their accountant and their solicitor at the beginning, before they start a business, um, and then in advance of a sale, well in advance of a sale, again, speak to your accountant, your solicitor, and perhaps a corporate finance advisor, uh, and speak to someone like Chris in the middle um, to mentor the business and, and, and shape it on its journey because you can't get too much advice. There's no such thing as too much advice. And 
people just, you know, we're, we're not born with the skill set. We learn it on the job. So if you are, if you have someone around you who can advise you and give you a steer and, and point you in the right direction, it just accelerates that journey. So I, w- I would say strongly take advice um, both before you start, in the middle, and then at the end, absolutely. But but don't leave it too late. Judy touched on her sort of five year versus nine year scenario. I go back to the thing I said at the start: better off sell a business ten years too early than a day too late. Um, yeah. But planning, you really, you need to plan for for, for all events. Very good. Thanks, Martin. Chris, you can have the last word on this, please. Um, yeah, look, I one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein is that the quality of thinking or understanding that got you this far is not good enough to build the whole thing that you want to build. So you have to keep an open mind and keep learning. And one of the best ways to do that is that there's, a, there's an idea that says you rise to the level of the six people you surround yourself with, right? So get some advisors, um, take the time out of the business to go and meet for lunch with someone who you, who you know has experience, uh, not just, you know, don't, don't necessarily pick someone who's done the exact same thing in your industry because there's what happened 10 years ago is no guarantee for what needs to happen today but find someone who understands human beings because if you don't understand human beings, you can't build a business. If you don't understand enough about marketing, you probably won't hire the right marketing people because they'll just, you know, tell you what they think needs to happen. You, you've got to, you've got to get the big picture. So surround yourself with people who know what they're talking about. Um, and, and, and in terms of what uh, Julie was saying earlier, if you're, a startup, um, one of the best things you could do is go to something like BNI, which is a networking group, which will help you get more business. Because what very often happens in the startup is you pick all the low hanging fruit, right? Your friends and people who know you, and then that runs out and then you don't know what to do next. So, so start networking early, uh, start putting your brand out there, um, as for the finish, I, I don't think there's a there's an easy answer to the finish. Um, I, I do think the best option is to build something that's good enough to sell and good enough to keep. Because depending on what it is, you might decide, right, the next stage for me is I'm going to become the chair of this business rather than be in the business. And slowly you're, you know, handing it over without just going, there you go. So, so yeah, keep your options open. Very good. And for those people thinking about networking, you can always join the British and Irish Trading Alliance too, folks, because that is a growing membership body and is very, very active with uh, lots of SMEs all doing some great things, people who know people that help people. So, folks, thank you so much for joining us. Julie, thanks for your insights. Martin, Chris, a pleasure as always to see you both. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a bit of business My name is John Fitzgerald. Thank you so much for watching. All the best for now. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you.